Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So my group, Danings Apprentices, which consists of Alfaf, my Sarah, Hema, and me myself, Nur Aisha, and Siti Nur Aina, are going to further explain about our topic, uh, public services and public servants in the federal constitution are crucial in the effective and efficient administration of the country. So these are our brief outlines that we're going to further discuss. Uh, so we'll be going to highlight regarding the introduction principles of public servants, procedural safeguards of Article 135, and the doctrine of pleasure. So I'm going to start with the introduction. So what are public servants? So as we can see, a public servant is actually a member of the public services, which has already been defined in Article 132, Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution. So public services actually consist of armed forces, the judicial and legal service, the general public service of the Federation, the police force, the joint federal state public service, the public service of each state, and the education service. However, we must also take note that employees of statutory bodies, public companies, universities, or any other body or authority established under federal or state law are not public servants for the purpose of the Constitution. Next, I'm just going to explain in brief about the history of the Public Service Department in Malaysia. So, in 22nd August 1934, the Malayan Establishment Office was established and the department was relocated to Kuala Lumpur when the administration shifted to Tanah Melayu in 1954. And the department moved to a new location in UMC building when the functions and size have increased from time to time. And there are several divisions providing counter service were placed in the city center of Kuala Lumpur to provide easy access to the public so it would be more convenient to the society around us and all the divisions were placed under one roof when the public service department of malaysia moved to its own building in the complex in 1993 and following the government's policy to centralize all government offices in one location at the federal government uh, the public service department was relocated to Complex C in Putrajaya on 15th of April 2001. And the competency management branch was stationed at um, Sapura, Sri Kembangan. And then following the Public Service Department Malaysia, it was rebranded in 2009. And the three divisions were also relocated to MK and Embassy in Cyberjaya, uh, as well as internal audit units. Salam sejahtera, my name is Hima and my metric number is 2023142. So today I'll be presenting about the topic of uh, principles of public servants. So the first principle is the public servants are entitled for impartial treatment after appointment. So this could be seen in Article 136 of the Federal Constitution, which states that all persons, regardless of their race, in the same grade in the service of the Federation shall subject to the terms and conditions of the employment and to be treated impartially. So this says that once a public servant enters into the public service, all the public servants should be treated equally and fairly. So that there, there must be no um, uh, unfairness and yeah, everybody is treated equally in it. So the next element is, I mean, the next principle is, uh, the public servant holds office during the pleasure of Yang Di Pertuan Agung. So this could be seen in Article 132 a of the Federal Constitution. So in this article, it states that uh, public servants listed under Article 132 Clause A till H holds office during the pleasure of the Yang Di Pertuan Agung. And as for the state, it's during the pleasure of the ruler or Yang Di Pertuan Negeri. So we could see uh, the judgment of these two cases where the first, in the first case, Haji Arifin against government of Pahang 1969. Uh, this was a federal court case. So in this case, the judge, have, I mean, the court 
held that in part Malaysia, there's no such thing as a permanent service because every member of the public service holds office during the pleasure of the Yang Di Pertuan Agong as for federal and as for state is a ruler or Yang Di Pertuan Negeri. So in the case of state public service, Commission Sarawak against Sarjit Singh Khaira, 1999, it was held that the length, time and place of a civil servant service are subject to the governor's pleasure. So we could see that the public servants holds office during the pleasure of Yang Di Pertuan Agong for the federal and as for the state is the ruler or Yang Di Pertuan Negeri. So the next principle is the public servants are only eligible and not entitled to pension. So referring to Article 147 of the Federal Constitution, which says about the protection of pensions, right? So it says that pension granted to a member of any of the public services or to his widow, children dependent or personal representative shall be that enforced on the relevant day or any later law not less favourable to the person to whom the award is made. So this says... Uh, to whom pension can be given. So if we see another law, uh, if we refer to Section 3 of the Pensions Act 1980, it says that the public servants have no absolute right to pension, gratuity or other allowances. The Yang Di Pertuan Agong may also reduce or withhold pension, but only if he is satisfied that the public servant is guilty of negligence, irregularity or misconduct. So the next point, next principle is the degree of security of employment of the public servants. So this could be seen in Article 135 of the Federal Constitution. So in the first clause of Article 135 uh, of the Federal Constitution states that no members of the public services except a member of the armed forces may be dismissed or reduced in rank by any authority subordinate to that which had the power to appoint. And the second clause says that no member of such a service of a force shall be di dismissed or reduced in rank without be giving a, a reasonable opportunity of being heard. So this provision gives the public servants an opportunity to be heard. So we could see the degree of security of the employment that they can't be just dismissed like that uh, or reduced their, their rank. And um, they also have the opportunity of being heard. So this shows the degree of it. Okay, so the last principle is the terms of office may be amended unilaterally. Uh, the authority, example, the authority can change the administrative rules and extra. So this could be seen in the case of Rajon Haji Sulaiman against government of Kelantan, 1976. In this case, a post-entry requirement of an examination was made to be a prerequisite for further increments. These rules are merely a directory and it can be changed to suit the public policy of the state. However, the court held that the government can unilaterally impose uh, and impose post-entry requirements on its employees. So we could see that this thing have been amended unilaterally. So that's from me. Thank you so much. So now moving on to the next point, which is regarding the procedural safeguards that is provided under Article 135. Um, as briefly uh, explained earlier by Sister Hema, Article 135 of the Federal Constitution provides some procedural safeguards for the public servant. And this right is only granted to public servants who have become the subject of disciplinary action. Um, in essence, the common law concept of natural justice influences uh, this right, where the right is one of the underlying principles of the rule of natural justice, which possess the important maxims, uh, which are the right to be heard, and second, the right uh, the rule against bias. So, the implication of the concept of natural justice can be seen in Article 135, uh, Clause 2 of the Federal Constitution, where it states that no public servant may be dismissed or reduced in rank without being given a reasonable opportunity of being heard, which basically adopts the concept of natural justice. Though it must be noted that it must be noted that the right to be heard does not simply imply the right to be heard orally, and hearing can be oral or by way of written representations. So, in the case of Naja Singh and government, the appeal to the Privy Council was on the ground that the appellant was not afforded a reasonable opportunity of being heard orally. Um, the Lordship Viscount Dilhorn 
in his judgment, explained the meaning of the words being heard in the regulation where he stated that in this passage, uh, which was cited by counsel on behalf of the appellant, the context shows that the words being heard meant being heard orally, but this passage is no support for the proposition that unless there is an oral hearing, there is denial of natural justice. Indeed, it points in the opposite direction. In another case, which is the case of Lembaga Tata Tertik Perkhidmatan Awam and Utrabadi, um, it states that all that is needed is that the officer concerned should have a full opportunity of stating his case. However, it must be noted that though a hearing need not be oral, the courts have in some cases sounded a caution that the measure of fairness given to the plaintiff is a question of fact and degree and in some circumstances, a fair hearing must permit oral representations. So moving on, um, Article 135 Clause 2 actually also provides some exceptions where the protection um, that is stated under this provision is not applicable. Okay, and we will have to look at um, all these um, exceptions. So the first exception is the obsession towards the armed forces where basically due to the combined effect of Article 132 Clause 1, 135 Clause 1 and 2, all members of the armed forces are excluded from the protection uh, under the OD Ultram Patum Rule or basically it says that no person shall be condemned unheard. Um, courts are generally reluctant to review any military proceedings um, and they claim that military discipline and justice in the court seem to be uneasy bad fellows. In, and in the case of Abdul Salam, it was held that the court has no jurisdiction to inquire into the circumstances under which the member of the uh, armed forces ce ceased to hold office. Um, however, this does not mean that the armed forces are stripped from their rights to be heard. For, for example, um, under Section 9 of the Armed Forces Act 1972, the YDPA or Yang Dipertuan Agong may on the recommendation of the Armed Forces Council at any time without assigning any reason therefore cancel any commission granted under the provision of this part. This indicates that the King's final decision to dismiss a member of the Armed Forces is exempted from, from the need to hold a prior hearing. It is debatable whether this obligation should be enforced in regard to the administrative inquiry that often comes before the recommendation. So now under Article 135 Clause 2, there are four situations where there is no need to give a hearing prior to the dismissal or reduction in rank. Firstly, it is where a criminal charge has been proved against a member of the service. Um, and in the case of Tan Tek Seng and Suruhan Zaya Perkhidmatan Pendidikan, um, a public servant against whom a criminal charge has been proved may or may not be dismissed solely in reliance on that ground. It all depends on the particular facts of each case. Another situation would be where the authority empowered to dismiss or reduce in rank is satisfied that for some reason to be recorded in writing, a hearing is not reasonably practicable. It is arguable that as the reasons have to be reduced to writing, they should be amenable to judici judicial review. The third exception is where the YDPA or Yang Dipertuan Agong, uh, the state ruler or Yang Dipertuan Negeri is satisfied that a hearing will not be in the interest of the security of the Federation. It is submitted that though issues of security are for the executive and not for the courts, judicial review is not totally altered. On the authority that was made in the case of Council of Civil Service Union and Minister for the Civil Service. But basically in that case, the court can insist that the executive should offer some proof that consideration of security are indeed at play. Lastly, um, the exception is where an order of detention, supervision, banishment, deportation or restricted residence has been imposed upon the public servant. These important exceptions were added to the constitution after the government's defeat in the case of Mahan Singh and these exceptions give the right to be heard to a vanishing point. So now we're going to move on to the next point. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi My name is Siti Miraina So I will discuss on the doctrine of the pleasure So what's meaning of the doctrine of pleasure Basically is that a Civil servants uh, They are subjected to the pleasures of the will So uh, by virtue of article 122 Class 2A of the Federal Constitution It's mentioned that every person who is a member of the public service In any services in the paragraph A, B, C, D, F and H of the class 1 holds the office during the pleasure of the ruler or yang di Ketuan Agung. Referring to the first cases, Haji Arifin against Government of Pahang 1969. So the, uh, the facts of the case is that the appellant who was a colleague in the services of the Pahang state challenged the validity of a letter written by the head of the religious affairs department of Pahang which uh, mentioned that his termination services uh, with the defendant have been given three months notice. So, in this case, the appellants argue that his termination is neither in accordance with the law of the state of Pahang nor consistent with the rules of the natural justice and therefore avoid. So, in this case, uh, the court dismissed the appeal on the ground that is it consistent with the constitution. And then the appellant's service is terminated has come within the meaning of Article One, three, sorry, Article One, uh, three, five, clause two, and termination of appellant's appointment by notice, appointment by notice regulation three six of the capital D of the public officer uh, is satisfied. In the next cases, governments of Malaysia against Mahan Singh nineteen seventy. 75, uh, the respondent brought an issue against the government for a declaration that the termination of his service was void. So in this case, the appellant's uh, previous uh, court alleged uh, that is it a void termination because it has contravened to Article 135 Clause 2 of the Constitution and the appellant had been dismissed without having given a reasonable opportunity of being heard by virtue of Article 135 Clause 2 even though the letter A7 did comply with the Section 10D of the Pension Ordinance and also Regulation 44 of Capital D of the Public Officer. So, the court in this case, uh, in the view that a pensionable public officer has no right to question on his post as the Regulation 44 is perfectly valid that the government had power to terminate the plaintiff service in the public interest so that the dismissal is a very dismissal also referring so we also referring to the case of governments of malaysia against rosalina only back in 1973 so in this case uh, the civilian federal judge in the view that the contract between the governments and the public servants in a specific contract because when she is appointed to her post, she acquires a status and her rights and obligation are not longer determined by contract but by employer which is the government. In the last cases which is the Pengarah Pelajaran Wilayah Persekutuan and others against Law Tinggi 1982 established the principle that the pleasure of the YDP is not only applied to the tenure of the office of an employee but also extend to a multitude of subject matters such as appointments, promotion, transfer, salaries, leave and other benefits. I think that's all for me. In conclusion, it is important for us to know that the public service in Malaysia is actually the backbone of our country because it creates great efficiency and effectiveness in both development and human resource management that inspire confidence and trust in civil service among the people which are the citizens of this country. Public services are firmly committed to the establishment of a quality administration as a national institution entrusted in carrying out the responsibility of realizing national goals and its objectives.
The strength of the government relies on the effectiveness and efficiency of public services since it plays a significant role in order to inform and advise their respective ministers regarding relevant information and the policies to ensure the implementation of the policies by the government is effective and efficient, even though they don't know whether the ministers will follow according their advices or not. Actually, in reality, the collaboration of the public, private, and governmental sectors, as well as the general public, is actually a solution for the effective governance to be in result. So promoting efficient governance is important for the success and interest of the society uh, in order for it to prosper. Therefore, public servants must show and demonstrate their willingness and ability to run public office with quality values and ethics in order to satisfy the public needs in order to develop the nation into a prosperous country. That is all for us. Thank you so much for listening.